the Lord. Can you hear me now? They said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Is this one working? No. Praise the Lord. Well, there's praise the Lord. Good for technology. Amen. Can we give it up for this praise team and this band this morning? They sounded wonderful. And I want to give a special thanks to uh, Katrina and Alex again. They cut their vacation short to come in today. Pastor Sonny is sick, and so they come back to to help us out, and so we appreciate that. Amen. I, I want to open up this morning. I want to talk to you for just a moment about prayer and fasting. Before I get into the the sermon, I, I want to share what God has put on my heart. Every year, uh, we've done a 40-day prayer and fasting season leading up to Resurrection Sunday. Believing God for a harvest of souls, believing God that as we seek the kingdom of God, seeking after souls, that God will minister to the needs in our life. How many of you know that God knows what you need of, amen? God knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you've got going on right now. He knows what you're going through, and God can see you through it all. I believe if we'll set first our hearts after the things that God's after, that's souls, that God will move, and that's what the Bible talks about, that Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. This year, I felt the Lord lay on my heart several months back. This year, not to do 40 days of prayer and fasting, but a 21-day time of prayer and fasting. Every year when we've done the 40 days, uh, I've always asked the entire body to get involved and, uh, and, and, and whatever the Lord would lay on their heart, but I've always asked that we have at least three people covering every day during that 40 days. What the Lord has laid on my heart for this year was a 21-day fast and inviting all of the body to participate. Not just one day, but all 21 days. Now, before you say, oh my goodness, I can't do that, let me talk just a moment about what, what fasting is in the Bible. In the Bible, there's three basic types of fast. One is an absolute fast. Uh, this is where we fast water and food. We know that, you know, scientists tell us that, you know, your body could only live about three days without water. I'm not asking you to, 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 uh, to, to partake of a full fast or an absolute fast for 21 days. The other is a normal fast where we would abstain from food um, for whatever the Lord would lay on our heart, whether it's one day or, 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 or however long it may be, uh, and you'd have all the liquid that, that you wanted. Uh, and then the other is a partial fast, or uh, you may hear people refer to the Daniel fast. That's what I'm going to preach about this morning, and, uh, but a partial fast, a Daniel fast. Uh, this is what I'm asking the whole body to participate in. A, a partial fast could be anything. You may give up, you know, one, one type of food for the duration. You may give up a meal for that duration. Uh, I've known of people that will fast certain times of the day, you know, from uh, uh, up till noon, they'll fast. In other words, they're not eating anything before, you know, lunch. They'd only eat, uh, you know, lunch and dinner, or some folks would only uh, only eat one meal a day. Um, but fasting, that's what the Bible, you know, the three forms of fasting. So what we're calling the body to participate in is a partial fast, a Daniel fast of some form, whatever the Lord would lay on your heart. Uh, I, I want to just teach for just a moment before I really get into the sermon this morning. As every year as we talk about fasting, I realize that some folks like myself, when I had uh, grown up, I'd never heard anybody talk about fasting, didn't know anything about it. Uh, I had read it in my Bible um, as I got saved, uh, but I still didn't really know a whole lot about it, didn't understand anything about it. I had read about it, uh, and so I understood that it was biblical, didn't really quite understand the significance. As I've grown in my walk with the Lord, I've, I've understood it on a different level, and, uh, but I've also made it point. I want to do a little teaching every year on what it means. And, um, and so first and foremost, I, I want to tell you something that Jesus advocated. There was a, uh, in Mark chapter 9, there was a young man who was uh, deaf and dumb, had this spirit on him, and the disciples uh, he was brought to the disciples. They tried to cast the demon out. They were not able to. They brought him to Jesus, and, and Jesus cast the spirit out of him, healed the young man. They were confused. They wanted to know, why Why could you cast the demon out, but we weren't able to? Now, you got to understand, at this point, these disciples had done other miracles. They had seen the power of God move through them, so they, were, uh, they, they had faith. Jesus said, I want you to understand, albeit this kind only comes out by, by prayer and fasting. 
What Jesus let them know right then and there is that there, there's a secret dimension uh, of power when we uh, combine prayer and fasting together. How many of you know today that there's power in prayer? Let me hear if you know there's power in prayer. I've seen God move in a mighty way in my own life. I've seen God bring miracles and healing. I know there's power in prayer, just like most of you. Uh, Well, Jesus is saying, you know, yeah, there's power in prayer, but there's a different level of prayer when you accompany it with fasting. Some miracles, some breakthroughs, some things you will only get through prayer and fasting. The way that I interpret that, there, there are some things that you will only get when you're willing to pay the price to get alone with God. Because fasting is really uh, just intimacy with God. It's drawing near to God. Uh, I, I, I want to give you just a couple of definitions of fasting. Uh, one is, it's a believer's voluntary abstinence from any legitimate pursuit for spiritual reasons. Um, Fasting, another definition, uh, the man puts it this way. Fasting means being so consumed with the matter, it becomes more important than food. Therefore, the believer sets food aside in order to concentrate on seeking God about the matter. Another man said it this way, denying myself something natural in order to lay hold of something supernatural. I hope you understand this morning that we are not just fleshly beings. Fleshly beings have fleshly needs, but we are also spiritual beings, amen? We have spiritual needs. This is what Jesus meant when he said, man doesn't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Fasting is intimacy with God. Prayer, I know, is intimacy with God. Let me just explain the difference, I believe, in in layman's terms or Pastor Mark's understand of it. I am a face-to-face kind of person. I've always been that way. There's nothing wrong with the telephone. I appreciate that. I appreciate the technology we have. We can text each other now. I appreciate even the old-fashioned letter, but I'm still a face-to-face kind of person. I've always been wired that way. If there's anything important that I've got to talk to you about, I don't want to do it in a letter. I don't want to do it in a text message. I won't. I I don't want to do it over the telephone. I want to sit down with you. I want to see you face to face. I want you to be able to look me in the eyes. I want to look you in the eyes. That's the way that my dad was, and maybe that's where I get it from. I don't know. But I've always been that way. There's nothing wrong, again, with with some of these other forms of communication. But for me, if you want to ask me for something, don't do it over the phone. Don't do it via text message. Come talk to me. I have more respect for it. I don't know why. You know, if you want to borrow the lawnmower from your neighbor, don't leave him a note on the front door saying, hey, can I borrow your lawnmower? Wait until the man's at home. Knock on the door. Look him eye to eye. Shake his hand. Talk to him. It's personal. For me, it's always meant more when somebody would come to me, and you can, you, you can agree or disagree. Maybe you're wired different. doesn't really matter. I'm just talking about me for a moment. It's always meant more to me when somebody would come face to face with me and talk about anything that's difficult. Don't talk about it behind my back, face to face. I believe that we're created in the image of God. Let me just explain this. I believe that there are some blessings that you only get when you're willing to pay the price to get into the presence of God. Prayer is wonderful, but sometimes our prayer life is nothing more than a passing prayer. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And every time that I I mention or read that scripture in church, I understand we're talking to church people. And God says you have not because you ask not. Well, when you say that to church folks, most of us say, Pastor, I ask God and I've asked a lot. And I still don't have. I've asked God. I've prayed about it and he still hadn't answered. The truth is sometimes our, our prayers are just passing prayers. We'll pray for something for, for one Sunday, maybe, maybe a week, and then we forget about it. Then we let it go. Then we assume that God's not going to answer or the answer's no, or maybe he's not listening. We, we, we get bored with it. It's not the same as when we really pursue after God. I believe that God's a face-to-face kind of God. The Bible talks about Moses and how Moses had such a relationship with God. The Bible says it was like God had a relationship with a friend. They met face-to-face. And there was a difference. Moses was obviously a man of prayer, a man of faith. 
But there was a season where Moses went up on the mountain. He fasted 40 days, was in the presence of God. When he came down from the mountain, it was unlike any other time of prayer. The Bible says his face was literally shining. It brought fear in the Israelites. They didn't know what to do. I mean, can you imagine? His face is glowing, radiating. He had to cover it with a veil because the people were so afraid. He had been in the presence of God. He had, he had been a man of prayer all along, but there was something different. When we enter into the presence of God, we make the sacrifice to be alone with God, to be intimate with God. Some of you have heard me say this before, so I apologize if you've heard it, but I don't have a better illustration. If you've got one, please share it with me, and I'll, I'll, I'll have two then. Years ago, my daughters took piano. I love their piano teacher, Miss Jetty, was wonderful, wonderful Christian lady, and, and we often had great discussions about various things, you know, in the Bible or, or the Lord. She asked me one day, she said, Mark, can I ask you something? Of course. She had children who were grown and, and grandchildren who were grown, and as a mother and grandmother, every year for their birthday, she always felt it important. She wanted to get them something. She would get a card for them and always put money in the card. That's wonderful. That's a good mom, good grandma. She said, let me ask you something. Do you think it's wrong for me not to mail it? She said, I've got grown kids who can come over, and, and sometimes they'll even call because they've come to expect that she does this every year. They'll call and say, Grandma or Mama, you know, did, did, you, did you get a card for me this year? She said, yeah, baby, I got it. It's on, the, it's on the counter in the kitchen. Whenever you come by, I want you to pick it up. She said, do you think it's wrong that I won't mail it to them? Did I hold it and make them come here to see me in order to get it? I said, no, ma'am, I don't think it's wrong at all. Do you? I believe today that God has blessings. Just like Mr. Judge, God has blessings with your name on it, miracles with your name on it, already laying aside, just waiting. They're not going to be released until you're willing to get alone with God. I believe this is what Jesus meant when he said, how be it some kind, this kind only comes out but by prayer and fasting. There's some blessings you're only going to get when you're willing to do a little bit more than a drive-by prayer on a Sunday morning or saying a quick prayer before you go to bed at night. There's some miracles, some breakthroughs you will only experience when you're willing to make the sacrifice to spend time with God. See, if you get alone with God, if, if, if you commit to this time of prayer and fasting over the next 21 days, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that there's going to be some television that's going to get missed. You're going to make time for God in these next three weeks that you don't typically make God for or time for. And I believe in that you'll see the blessings of God. I do believe, and I felt this way since the beginning of the year, maybe a little bit more, that this year, by Resurrection Sunday, three weeks from today, that there's going to be miracles in some of your lives. There's going to be situations that God is going to revive. There's going to be healings and miracles that take place through God's power and for God's glory. And I'm believing God for these things. But I believe for some of us, the only way that we're going to see it is when we are willing to get alone with God. Real quick, i am not got to my sermon yet. I promise that I, I'll get there. J.I. Packer says this way, when friends need to get together, he says they will cancel all other activities in order to make that possible. Think about that for a moment. When you want to get alone with somebody, you'll cancel anything else that you need to to make that possible. When I was dating my wife, I wasn't living right. I, I was involved in all sorts of extracurricular activities. She was a good girl. I didn't take her into most of the mess that I was involved in. But I had all kind of invitations to do all sorts of things, and I would say no because there was this cute girl that I was kind of smitten with. When two friends want to get together... They will cancel all other activities in order to make that possible. This is what he says. There's nothing magical about fasting. It's just one way of telling God that your priority at this moment or this season is to be alone with him. This is what fasting is. This is where he says, God, I'm, I'm going to say no to some of these things right now because I really need to get alone with you. I need to spend time with God. The truth is we're talking to the church this morning. Many of us, we know the power of prayer, and yet we're not faithful to pray. We're scattered at best with our prayer. Fasting is get alone with God. 
Donna Whitney, author of Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, describes fasting this way. Fasting hoists the sails of the soul in the hopes of experiencing the gracious wind of God's Spirit. It does not guarantee spiritual blessings, but it puts us in a position to experience it as God moves. I like that definition. I'm very visual. I can see it. It's, it's like a, a, a sailboat with, with no motor on it, sitting in the middle of the ocean, being tossed this way and that way, desperate to get out of the storm, desperate to get back to safety. The only way that it will get out is through the hand of God, through the movement of God. That sailboat would not sit there and say, hey, God, you're a big God. You can pick the boat up at any point and put us on the shore. They wouldn't leave the sails deflated and just expect God to do everything. No, no, no. What they would do is that they would hoist the sails by faith, believing that God would do what only God can do and send the wind. This is what fasting is. It's you and I hoisting the sails of faith, saying, God, I'm believing you to do what only you can do. This morning, before I get into the message, I want to ask you to ponder this thought. What is it that you need God to do in your life today? Maybe it's a miracle you need in your family, a miracle in your finances. Maybe it's healing for your body, healing for your marriage. What is it that you need God to do? Deliverance from addiction or bondage. Deliverance from a spirit of depression, healing for your mind. What is it that you need God to do? He's still able. As you ponder that thought, I want to ask you another question. Who in your life, family, friends, loved ones, need Jesus in their life right now? I want you to think about those names. These are people that God's put within arm's reach of you. Last week, as we talked about the gates, I read for you 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The weapons of our warfare, they are not fleshly weapons, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I believe that there's power in prayer, and I believe that if you will make time to get along with God and by faith hoist the sails up, believing God for the needs that you have in your life, that you'll see God move in a way that only he can. If you will begin to lift up by faith the names of these people that you know need Jesus, I mean relentlessly call out their names, I believe that you will see God do what only God can do. The weapons of our warfare, they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Amen? The title of my message this morning is Start Praying and Don't Stop. Look at somebody near you, in your car with you, or in the car beside you and tell them, start praying and don't stop. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing. And that understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three Full weeks, 21 days. And I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine into my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up my eyes and I looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the burial. His face is the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled and hid themselves. Therefore was I alone 
and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Let me stop there. He said, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. I believe this morning that what God is showing me, he's going to show some of you. But understand this, not everyone will take hold of that vision. Some of you have heard me say for weeks, God's going to do something by Resurrection Sunday in some of your life. There'll be healings and there'll be miracles that take place. And some of you are sitting on the sidelines, skeptics, saying, well, I can't wait to see the show. Not everyone's going to see by faith what God has put before them. But some of you today, I believe like Daniel, if you'll take hold of the vision, the promise of God, you'll see it come to pass in your life. For the skeptic, you'll see it from the sideline. You'll witness other people get their blessing, get their breakthrough. You'll begin to witness other people's miracles, but you yourself will leave deflated and disappointed. Or you can choose today, I'm going to press in. I'm going to believe that God's the same God today as he's always been. The same God that parted the Red Sea is my God today. The same one that healed the lame in the past is my God today. The one that opened the eyes of the blind, the one that raised the dead, he's my God. The God that makes all things possible, that's my God. I'm going to dare to believe him in spite of what my mind tells me, in spite of what my doctor says, in spite of what the naysayers around me. I believe in the power of God. Can I get an amen? I believe that there's power in God. He's the name above all names. I believe that there's power in prayer. A formidable weapon. He says, yet I heard the voice of his words, verse 9. When I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. Or we might say in Pentecostal circles, he was slain in the spirit. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee I am now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and chasten thyself before God, thy words, thy prayers were heard, and I am come for thy words or the prayers. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, or twenty-one days. But O Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. The weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You and I this morning, we are in the middle of a spiritual battle. Every day, whether you realize it or not, whether you believe it or not, the reality is there is a spiritual battle waged every day for the souls of men. The devil will do anything he can to keep you from the presence of God, from the salvation of God, from the deliverance of God, from the healing, from the miracles of God. He will do whatever he can to hinder that. I'm very visual and, again, very simple in the way that I think about things, and I've always thought the weapons of our warfare, the weapons. When I start thinking about weapons, all I know is carnal weapons, fleshly weapons. I think about a gun. If I were to hold a gun up here this morning and ask you how many of you believe that this weapon is a deadly weapon, a powerful weapon, I believe all of us would concede, oh, pastor, I know that a gun is a powerful weapon, a deadly weapon. We have so much confidence, in fact, even if we've never shot one, if we had one of those weapons on us and an enemy came after us or towards us who did not have the weapon, he began to tell us that, listen, if you don't lay that gun down, I'm going to kill you. If he didn't have a weapon, you know what you'd do? You wouldn't lay that gun down. You'd stand there toe-to-toe. Because you believe so much in the power of that weapon. What if that enemy told you, well, I don't believe in guns. I don't care if you believe or not. Doesn't change the reality that this weapon's powerful. It doesn't change anything, does it? But he said, I don't believe that it's loaded. It doesn't matter whether you believe it's loaded or not. It makes no difference. 
Your faith or lack of faith does not negate or change the power of this weapon, the potential of this weapon. Amen. Now, I would to God, I wish to God that some of us would understand that prayer, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They're not fleshly like a gun, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. It's more powerful than any atomic bomb, more powerful than any gun that you can hold, more powerful than anything that you and I know, the power that we have in prayer. And yet we so easily allow the enemy to disarm us. We have legitimate, real needs, desperate needs. And we'll come to God on a Sunday and we'll pray and then we'll give up. We'll pray a little bit in the middle of the night as we weep on our pillow and then we'll forget about it by next week. Deep in the Costa Rican jungle lives a little small tomato frog. Red in color like a tomato, he has a unique defense system against enemies. Once he is attacked, he emits a deadly milky white poison all over his skin. As the attacking animal bites into the little tomato frog, it tastes the poison and spits the frog out. Unfortunately, By the time the enemy has attacked the frog and spits him out, the amphibian ends up dying anyway. I share that because I believe that many of us are just like that tomato frog. We wait until the enemy has attacked us to then try and use the weapons that we have been given. We wait until something devastating happens. We wait until our spouse is ready to go to divorce court before we start praying for our marriage. We wait until our children are strung out on drugs or they don't want to come back home. We wait until they leave the church before we get serious about praying for them. Can I meddle a moment? I'm not really asking. I'm just telling you to get ready. Mom, Dad, are you faithful to pray over your own children? I'm talking about every day, relentlessly, passionately. We know that we should, but the reality is most of us this morning, we are guilty of neglecting that duty. We pray about them when we think about it. We definitely pray about them once the attack has come. Let them get sick, we think about praying then. Let something happen, we get serious about praying then. If we understood truly the power of the weapon that we've been given in prayer and fasting, I believe that many of us would use it. We would lean on it. We would rely upon it. We would stand by faith in the word of God, even against all opposition. Refusing to be moved, refusing to be disarmed. Daniel was in the middle of a battle. But Daniel didn't wait. Daniel was a man of prayer all of his life. Daniel, as a teenage boy, was virtually kidnapped. Brought into Babylonian captivity. And Daniel and several of the other Hebrew boys decided that they would honor God. You've heard of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They decided when they had been taken in captivity that they wouldn't eat of the king's meat. Daniel would put his trust in God and trust God to sustain him. And God blessed them as they were in prayer and fasting, even as a teenage boy, and God blessed them with favor. And God kept them, and they grew stronger and looked better than all the other young boys. All of Daniel's life, even through difficult seasons and times, Daniel lived a life of prayer. He knew that there was something about being in the presence of God that changed every storm that he would encounter, every trial that he would face, every difficulty that he would endure. Daniel realized there's something about being in the presence of God before the attack of the enemy that will get me through the deepest, darkest valleys. Daniel was such a man of prayer And the power of God moves over Daniel's life so much, in fact, that the enemy set up a plot to destroy him. Some men rose up and went and told the king, hey, king, 
You're the best thing ever. Nobody in the kingdom should worship anybody but you. They shouldn't pray to anybody but you. The king thought it was a good idea. He said, you're right. They convinced him to make a decree that anybody would do that must be put to death. So basically a decree went out throughout the whole kingdom that all of a sudden it's illegal to pray unless you're praying to the king. Daniel threw the doors open of his house so the whole world could see. I'm not ashamed to be in prayer. I'm not ashamed to visit with God. I'm not ashamed to be in the presence of God or for you to know that I've been in his presence. And Daniel prayed anyway publicly. The plot thickens a little bit. They do exactly what they wanted to do. They go and tell the king, Daniel disobeyed. The king was sad. He loved Daniel and felt like he had no choice but to throw Daniel into the den of lions. You know the story. Daniel being tossed into the den of lions. The king is upset with himself. But Daniel tells him this, hey, king, don't worry about it. God's got me. God will save me. Who says that? Who can say something like that when you're about to be thrown into a den of hungry lions? The man that's been in the presence of God, that's who. The man who didn't wait for the attack to come, he's already been in the presence of God and he knows the God that he visits with regularly will be with him even in the pit. As Daniel was tossed into the den of lions, God shut the mouth of every one of those lions. When the king wakes up the next morning, rushes to the lion's den, lifts the cover off, there's Daniel with a smile on his face. There's something powerful that happens when you and I spend time in the presence of God, not waiting for the attack of the enemy to hit and then responding in prayer. Jesus said, this is what I'm telling you. There are some miracles, some breakthrough, some deliverance that you will only find through prayer and fasting. More than just a little Sunday morning tickle prayer. More than just a little Sunday afternoon blessing over the meal. More than just a little midnight prayer before you go to sleep. In verse 2 and 3, it says, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Spiritual warfare. And Daniel's not sitting by as a passive participant. Daniel is taking an active stance. Daniel's saying, I'm in the middle of this thing and I'm getting alone with God by faith. I'm believing God to do what only God can do. At this point in Daniel's life, we believe he's 75, maybe 90 years old. And Daniel's still a man of prayer and fasting. A man who believes in the power of God so passionately that he will not surrender his weapon. He'll not give up. He will not assume that the enemy's got the upper hand. No, quite the contrary. Daniel is quite confident that he's got the upper hand. So Daniel prays one day, two days, three days, 10 days, 20 days, 21 days. Daniel's still praying. Daniel doesn't just say a once and done prayer and assume that he's heard from God and the answer is no. He won't be deterred. He won't be discouraged because that's the attack of the enemy. The Bible says he's the father of all lies. One of the greatest tactics the enemy uses is the lies of discouragement telling you that God doesn't care about you. He's not interested in your prayers. Your prayers aren't important. Maybe God's not listening Maybe God doesn't care. We've all been there. We've all thought that in our prayers. That's why many times we've prayed a little bit and then we've given up. Daniel prays passionately. Think about that gun again. Because we can relate to this. If you know that that gun is a powerful weapon and the enemy comes to attack you, you point the weapon and all you hear is click. You pull the trigger again, click. Are you going to come to the determination at that point that, that guns don't work? 
just because you pulled the trigger a time or two and all you heard was click, it didn't give you the desired results or the intended results. It didn't do what you thought it would do. Are you going to say guns don't work? No, you're going to say, give me some bullets. Too often we'll pray on Monday and give up on Tuesday. We'll say a little prayer and it felt like it hit the ceiling of heaven and fell back. The devil will convince us that God doesn't care. God's not listening. Maybe the answer is no, because all we heard was click, click, click. Daniel's praying. One day, click. Two days, click. Three days, click. 20 days, click. But Daniel's still believing God. Listen to me. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Daniel understands that God hears my prayer even when it doesn't feel like it. I know he does. Church, let me, let me ask you, will you just think back in your own life how faithful God's already been to you? Think back at the times that you know without a shadow of a doubt that God intervened in your life. Truth is, many of you, just like me, you wouldn't even be here this morning had it not been for the hand of God. You have witnessed firsthand the faithfulness of God. You don't need a sermon to rile you up or to remind you, you know what God has done. So when you pray and the devil says God doesn't hear you, you can tell him, devil, it might have misfired that time, but I've come too far to believe your lies now. I know that God hears my prayer. There was that time in the lion's den where God brought me out of it. There was my buddies who were thrown into the fire, but God walked with them and brought them through it. I know, devil, that God hears my prayers. I might not see the answer yet, but it's on the way Daniel is fasting and praying, believing God, even when it looks like God is nowhere to be found. Daniel's resting on the power of prayer and the reality of God's presence. Our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapons aren't just enough to hold the devil off so we can run and hide. Not just enough so you and I can get by or make it. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Daniel fasted and prayed Verse 17, he says, As for me, no strength remains in me now, or is any breath left in me. Daniel has been so passionately pursuing God over a situation that involves the kingdom and the nation of God's people. Really not even Daniel's personal problem. But he has been so passionately pursuing God that he says, I'm weak in my body. I'm depleted. I've got no energy left, and yet he's still seeking God. Listen to me. If anybody that thinks prayer is easy, it's because they've never agonized in prayer. They're not really a prayer warrior. Prayer is not easy. Sometimes you don't feel like praying. Let me not talk for you. Let me just tell you about your pastor. I know the power of prayer. I've seen the reality of the power of prayer displayed in my own life and in those around me. And yet the reality and the truth of the matter is there are times that I become so weak, so discouraged in my own faith, I don't feel like praying. Can I be transparent with you and tell you the devil fights your preachers too? Sometime even as a pastor, I doubt the enemy gets into my mind. How do you combat that? You look back 
all these things were for a memorial. So when I preach to you, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. That's because I remind myself of that all the time. When the devil's whispering in my ear, here we are, day 15 or day 20, and God hadn't done anything yet, and he says, where's your God now? I don't always know the answer to that other than to stand on the word of God. He said he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I don't know exactly where he's at, devil, but I know he's with me. I know he's with me because I look back over my life and there have been many storms that I didn't know where he was at till I came out on the other side and I realized he was with me in the fire all along. That's where he was. Peter's walking on the water, takes his eyes off of Jesus, begins to sink. Where was God when it all happened? He was right there. He snatched Peter up by the hand. Daniel's still praying. He's still believing God. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Jesus said, if you have Matthew 17, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, remove from here to yonder place and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Let me ask you for just a moment. Contemplate where you really stand on that. Do you really believe that with God all things are possible? I really want you to think about that because how you feel about that will determine what you do with the weapon of prayer. If you really don't believe that a gun is a powerful weapon, then you won't have any problem throwing it down and running. If you really don't believe that that gun is a powerful weapon, you will allow the enemy to disarm you easily. You'll abandon it But if you know the power of that weapon, even if you've never used it yourself, you'll hold on tightly to that. You'll stand your ground. You will refuse to be disarmed or to be moved. If you truly believe that all things are possible with God, then stand on his word. Matthew 70 said, if you have faith of a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, remove from here to yonder, and it'll be done, and nothing will be impossible to you. And the very next verse, he goes on to say this, how be it this kind, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. The Bible says that we are to ask and keep asking. Knock and keep knocking, seek and keep seeking. Why? Why would God want us to keep asking? Is God making it difficult? No. God's saying you've got to ask and be relentless because there's a spiritual battle going on. And the moment that you begin to ask, the devil rises up to discourage, to dissuade anything he can to hinder you from the blessing of God. One man said this of his prayer life. He said, when I pray, I push. When everything seems to go wrong, I just push. When the job gets me down, I just push. When people don't react the way I think they should, I just push. When my finances aren't going right, I just push. When I want to curse people out, I just push. When people don't understand me, I just push. Push. I pray until something happens. Push. 
Some of you have been praying over a need in your life for a little while. I'm telling you, keep praying. And don't stop. Push. Praying for a loved one to come back. For a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter, a loved one, a husband, a wife. Keep praying. Don't stop. Push. Praying for healing in your body, but it doesn't look like it's coming. Push. The moments before the greatest miracles and breakthroughs in your life are filled with such extreme pain and agony. Ask any woman who's ever given birth to a child, the most painful moment in pregnancy came just before the birth, just before the breakthrough, just before the miracle. And when you feel that pain, you feel that discouragement. Now's not a time to give up. Now's not a time to quit. Now's the time to push. Pray until something happens. Daniel's praying. 21 days go by. The angel Lord shows up on the 21st day and says, Daniel, the moment, listen to me, the moment you knelt down to pray, Daniel, God dispatched the answer. The moment you started praying, heaven started moving. Pay attention here, church. The moment, Daniel, the moment you hit your knees, God started moving. But the enemy showed up and there has been a battle going on in heaven over the answer to your prayer. Gabriel shows up, tells Daniel, I have been wrestling and fighting and battling my way to bring you your answer. Sometimes I believe we give up too quick. Sometimes I think we stop praying before the answer shows up. Daniel is living in between the prayer and the answer. Daniel is living in a war zone where he feels the pressure of the enemy pushing against him. He feels the weight of what's going on in his life. And he's prayed about it, but the answer has not come. What do you do when you're living in between the prayer and the answer? You push. I'm getting ready to close, but listen. This is a testimony of a pastor. Years ago, a pastor said after preaching several camp meetings in 1963, he said, I had a breakdown from overwork and at the close of the California camp, I couldn't even preach the last night. So I climbed on an airplane in Los Angeles going home. I was in unforgettable misery. And he went on to say, he said, I walked through the darkest valley of my life for the next 100 days. I want to stop for just a moment. This is a pastor who's been preaching the fire of God, watching people get saved and healed and delivered. And the battle around him becomes so intense. The darkness overtakes him. He's overwhelmed. He has a breakdown. He can't even preach the last night of this meeting. And he goes home in defeat. And the next 100 days, he said, I was in the darkest place of my life. He said, weakness overwhelmed me. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. He said, I melted down to merely 125 pounds. I became so weak. So unable to eat, he said, I started trying to eat baby food just to get something down, some nourishment. And he said, I had many, many people praying for me, 
but my deeply troubled mind could not focus on anything. Finally, one day I started praying again. And I cried to the Lord. Let me just stop. Found that interesting. This preacher, he said, finally, I started praying again. A man that knows the power of prayer and has witnessed it in so many ways and yet abandons it. Yes, the reality is sometimes the enemy discourages, frustrates us so much that we lay the weapon down. But I love this. He said, finally, I started praying again and I cried to the Lord Jesus. All my life you've dealt with me in visions and dreams. Please speak to me tonight and show me why I cannot receive my healing. He said, that night I dreamed. And I looked into a large room and a quivering little bird sat in the middle of the floor. I looked and I wondered why. Suddenly I heard a noise, a huge snake came out of a hole in the wall, slithered toward the little bird as though he would eat him. The long serpent could have easily reached the little bird without even coming completely out of his hole. As I watched this, I thought this will be the end of the little bird. But instead, the snake taunted him with questions. Why have you been sick for so long, little bird? When will you get well? Are you going to eat, little bird? Then the snake would slither back to his hole. The little bird shook violently in fear, trembling from the encounter. And by the time that he would become almost calm, the snake would return to torment again. Again and again this happened. I felt someone standing beside me as I watched this scene repeated over and over and over again. And I said, why doesn't the snake just eat the little bird and get it over with? The snake comes slithering out of his hole again, but this time he stopped with his head only a few inches away from me and I saw a screen muzzling the head of that serpent. And the voice said to me, you are the little bird. The spirit said, the serpent is the devil, but I have him muzzled. He cannot destroy you except with words. If you'll stop listening to his lies and believe my word, you will get well. The pastor said another vision, then followed the dream. This vision completed my healing. I stood at the foot of the world's highest mountain, surrounded by many lower hills. And as I looked behind me, I saw murky black water rising, rising rapidly. I climbed the mountain, but as fast as I climbed, the waters rose behind me. Finally, I reached the top running from the terrible black waters of depression. I could still see the smaller hills below me, but the water continued to rise until it reached my knees. Suddenly, a howling wind accompanied the storm. The wind screamed at me with a ghostly voice, give up. What's the use of struggling? You've climbed the highest peak. And there's no place to go. This is it. This is the end. And I saw a tidal wave coming, 80 to 100 feet high. And I thought, surely, this is the end. Everything's against me. There's nowhere to go. There's no way to escape. Then out of heaven came a long, strong voice. Have you forgotten the power of my name? I shook myself. Maybe like Samson did when the Philistines came against him. And I raised my hand and I lifted my voice. Waves, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. The high wave lay down immediately at my feet like a kitten on the hearth at the old home place. Instantly the wind, the storm clouds, and the murky waters disappeared. And the sun began to shine brightly. Springtime flowers in full bloom began to blossom all around. And I saw the dew sparkling on the bushes and trees. And I declared, this is it. I am healed. Depression in the name of Jesus Christ is gone. And from that day forward, I was healed. I've come to tell you this morning, there's power in the name Jesus. There is power in praying to that name this morning. The weapons of our warfare 
They're not carnal. They're not guns and knives. They're much more powerful. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Daniel prayed and fasted 21 days. And every day when there was no answer and it felt like the heavens were brass and it looked like nothing was happening. From the very first moment that he began to pray, God began to move. The Lord showed up and said, Daniel, there's a battle that's been going on. Trying to hinder your miracle, hinder the answer to your prayer. Keep praying. Keep pushing. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Wednesday I shared this testimony with a family in the church. It said they had a loved one that they were praying for last year and as they prayed they did a little better but now they've drifted back I said are you still praying I said no things got better we kind of slacked off I shared with them this story a pastor friend of mine true story he's a pastor today he grew up in a pastor's home When he graduated high school, he didn't want to go to church anymore, didn't want to serve God. He wanted to party and have fun. He got into drugs and selling drugs. He knew that his parents wouldn't tolerate that, so he moved out. He said, I moved out because I knew they wouldn't tolerate it for one and for two. I didn't want to hear my mama praying for me every night. It's tough to listen to your mama in the bedroom calling your name out with tears and trying to live the way you want to live. He said, so I moved out. Moved down to the beach several hours away from home so I could live the fast life, do what I want, have fun. A young man, single, enjoying life. He said, then one night, a drug deal went wrong. Guy pulled a gun on him. Pulled the trigger of that gun. He said, when I heard it click, He said, I bolted. I took off running as fast as I could. I jumped in my car, I fired it up, and I went tearing down the road. I didn't know where to go. I was scared to go back home because he knew where I lived. He said, I was afraid that he'd come and kill me. Drove around for a little while. I didn't know where else to go, and I thought the only place that I know I can go and be safe, I'll go to mom and daddy's. He drove three hours to get back home. All this happened about one o'clock in the morning. Knowing where they kept the spare key, he said, I tried to slip in the front door and I was going to go to my bedroom and just go to sleep. When I cracked open the door, mama was pacing in the living room. She looked at me and said, what's going on, baby? He said, nothing, mama, I'm tired. I want to go to bed. She said, no, no, no. God woke me up at one o'clock in the morning to pray for you. I want to know what's been going on. I've been pacing this floor, calling out your name and praying for you since one o'clock this morning. He said, I buckled on my knees. I began to weep. I gave my heart to Jesus Christ right there at four o'clock in the morning in my mom and daddy's living room on the floor. And I can't help but wonder today What might have happened if mama would have just rolled back over and went back to bed? Maybe he wouldn't be here today. Every head bowed and every eye closed. What do you need God for in your life right now? What do you need God to do right now in your life, in your family? What are the names of those loved ones who desperately need Jesus Christ? I'm asking you to spend the next 21 days praying for them relentlessly, praying for those needs passionately with expectation that God will do what only He can do. He's faithful. He's done it before. 
You've seen him do it in your own life, and he can do it again. Don't give up, Daniel. Don't stop praying now. Believe God. Will you believe God for a miracle with me? Can I count on you to join with me in this spiritual battle and together believe God to save our children, to save our spouses, to save our marriages, our friends? Every head bowed and every eye closed, those same needs that I asked you to think about earlier. Will you lift those up to God now? Those names of the people in your life that need to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Will you begin right now this morning lifting those names up before the throne of heaven? Right where you are this morning, will you begin to pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you've given me a name. A name above all names to call upon. A name above cancer, sickness. A name above divorce. A name over depression. Addiction. By faith today, I call to that mighty name. By faith today, I hoist the sails of faith and belief that you are still able to do what only you can do. With man, it may be impossible, but I know with you all things are possible. I believe today that you can heal my body. I believe today that you can save my loved one. I believe today that you can deliver them from depression, that you can heal that broken heart, that you can restore my marriage and my family. I believe today that you can heal my body of this disease. And I refuse today to surrender the weapon of prayer. Over these next three weeks, God, I commit my heart to pursue you. To push some things away. To intentionally make more room for you and more time for you in my schedule. Because now is not the time for lazy prayers, for half-hearted prayers. Just as this mother's boy, his life, his very life hung in the balance. May we understand the reality today that there's an urgent, desperate need for prayer warriors to stand in the gap. So as one body, Lord, we pledge to stand in the gap together, praying one for another, praying for souls, and expecting a harvest, expecting miracles and signs and wonders testimonies of what you're doing Lord I thank you for your word I thank you today by faith for what you're going to do and I pray in Jesus name today that strongholds are broken that miracles are brought forth as a testimony of your faithfulness Lord the souls are won to the kingdom of God by resurrection Sunday in Jesus name we pray Amen. God bless you, church. I love you.